Hi, I'm Rui Pereira da Costa, organizer of this International Endo Masters 2015. Welcome to the second day of Congress. I hope you're enjoying the lecture so far, but believe me, there's still plenty to come. I must thank all the messages I've been receiving. They are truly motivational and a boost of energy for my efforts in this project. So today, we start with a lecture from my friend Antonio Gingeira from Lisbon, Portugal. Antonio is the head of the Department of Endodontics at the Lisbon Dental School, director of the postgraduate programs of endodontics and vice dean of the dental school. Antonio was a pioneer in the use of endodontic microscope in Portugal back in 1995. So it is a great honor to have him participating in this World Online Congress and will have the opportunity to watch a great presentation on endodontic emergencies. I'm sure you'll enjoy. Don't forget to use the comments area if you'd like to send a question or comment. Let me know your thoughts about the Congress. See you soon. Hello, my name is Antoine Gingere and I'm the head of the Department of Endodontics in the University of Lisbon Dental School. I'm very happy to be here to share my views on endodontic emergencies with you and I was very pleased to accept uh, Rui's invitation to be uh, part of in this uh, project. I hope you all like it as much as I do. Thank you for being here. Hello, thank you all for being here. Today we're not going to talk about life-threatening problems that usually happen in emergency room, nor are we going to discuss accidents, trauma and uh, serious disease that uh, happen in this TV series. We are going to talk about endodontic emergencies, which can also be very dramatic and if uh, we perform well, we also deserve some applause in the end. The patient usually comes with intense and persistent pain and he also can bring some swelling along. The additional problem is that the patient-dentist relation, uh, patient relation all, very often begins in this situation. And this occasion is not the best one to to start uh, this relationship because it's uh, the patient is usually in pain, is very stressed, and um, in this position he has to uh, to start a new relation, and we need to have his confidence so that we can perform our treatment well. And how do we evaluate uh, the severity of the case? Well, we can check if there is some interference with the regular daily activities, like the sleep. Uh, in this in this occasion, uh, when in a real <coughs> endodontic emergency, the patient usually does not sleep very well. He cannot sleep very well because he has pain. Also, he cannot take his meals as he should because it is painful for to to chew. It is painful to use his his mouth for for having some food. Also, the the pain usually disturbs his work and uh, his attention. So uh, there's really a big interference with the. Uh, 
the most simple activities. Another characteristic is that um, the symptoms usually began some two or three days ago and not more because an, a real uh, a real endodontic emergency is very disturbing and the patient cannot stand uh, this situation for for a long period of time. We can also evaluate the severity of the case by the need the patient has to take painkillers and these patients usually take a lot of analgesics in, the, in an effort to relieve the pain and to get rid of it which is usually not very easy because there's an inefficacy of the drug and or the, the analgesia is only efficient for a very short period of time and so the patient usually takes a lot uh, of, uh, of uh, painkillers trying to, to get some relief. He can also show some systemic symptoms or signs like fever or <coughs> a lack of, uh, of strength and um, this is a a uh, way we, we have to see how the, the symptoms and how the disease is affecting the whole body. The patient's perspective of the, how serious his case is relies on different aspects. The personality is uh, very important, very important for the, the way he reacts. Uh, some people have a very strong personalities and react uh, in a very mildly to, to pain. Other peoples are more fragile, they'll react accordingly to, to the pain. The, the emotional condition is also very important. The same person will react in a way if he's very relaxed and will react differently if he's in a stressed in a stress situation, either either job or family or or other, but um, this can really affect the way the same pe same person reacts to to pain. The tolerance to pain is also different from one person to others. Uh, some some people uh, are very pain tolerant and. Uh, they will react very mildly to what we would believe would be a, a severe pain and the other people react very uh, very intensely to, to what we consider would be a, a mild pain. So it's a, we cannot really measure the quantity of pain and the, there's not really a direct relation between the pain and the way the some or people or other will react to it. This also relies on previous experiences. If uh, one person had uh, bad experiences in a, a certain with a certain disease or a certain situation, uh, will tend to react uh, more uh, if he will have a, a similar situation later on. So, if a patient has had a, a bad experience with a, with a root canal treatment some years ago or with, a, uh, with an endodontic emergency, he will react very bad if he has another endodontic emergency. But in any case, there is a need for urgent treatment because we are either with the pain, and the, usually this is very intense pain, and this is caused by infection, and we very, very frequently have also swelling that uh, can affect the, the, the patient. There are several types of emergencies. We can consider pre-treatment emergencies during the treatment 
and the emergencies that uh, come after the that arise after the treatment. Pre-treatment emergencies are usually of pulper origin or of periodontal but endodontic origin. We have of pulper origin the irreversible pulpitis or the crack, crack tooth or uh, vertical tooth fracture. On the, on the other hand, you can have periodontic or endodontic origin and this will be the symptomatic apical periodontitis and the acute apical abscess. The em emergencies that uh, can happen during treatment are the procedural mishap or complication or the flare-up. In the procedural mishaps or complications, the one of the most uh, frequent is the hypochlorite accident or the perforation, over-instrumentation of the canal and extrusion of debris. The post-treatment emergencies are usually flare-ups or complications or mishaps. So let's talk a little about reversible pulpitis. Irreversible, irreversible pulpitis is the most, maybe the most characteristic of the endodontic emergencies. It is a situation in which the patient complains of uh, spontaneous and intense pain, uh, which uh, persists for several minutes. This, the, this is always also uh, accompanied by the, an intense pain with cold food and liquids that lingers from seconds to minutes. In, on a second phase, the pain is triggered by hot liquids and food and will be relieved by cold. This is the typical situation in which the patient comes in your office, in your practice, with uh, a bottle of water and he is constantly putting the, the water in the mouth to relieve the pain. In this drawing we can see a normal pulp in the normal tooth. Then, with a, with a carious lesion here, the pulp becomes inflamed uh, superficially and the, in the area related to the carious. When the carious progresses, also does the inflammation, which grows and, uh, <coughs> and becomes bigger and bigger. As the carious progresses further, we can see here a uh, necrotic focus in the, in the, um, within the inflamed pulp. And this is the, the situation where the irreversible pulpitis begins. It will then progress more and uh, some bacteria will invade these necrotic tissues and uh, we have uh, uh, below it uh, a bigger area of inflamed pulp. And now to show a clinical case, you can see here in this lower first molar an amalgam restoration here and composite restoration there, some caries beneath and uh, so it was decided to do a new restoration. It was Performed the new restoration, and we see the pulp horn is very close to the to the restoration. And Im immediately after, say one week or two weeks after, the patient began complaining with a very intense pain to cold, cold liquids, and uh, and uh, after that with a spontaneous pain. So we decided to do root canal treatment 
and immediately after the patient referred she the pain has disappeared and she, she was well uh, after which are the main problems with the uh, reversible pulpitis well one of those uh, refers to the diagnosis and is the identific identification of the responsible tooth it's very very often these patients complain of of a tooth that is not the real responsible for the pain the there are very frequently uh, an irradiation of pain to the to the adjacent tooth or even to uh, a bit a bit uh, further uh, tooth it's um, I've, we all have cases of uh, patients complaining for an incisor when the 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 cause of the pain is a is a molar, for instance. Uh, we have some some patients that complain from a, a, an upper tooth when the the cause is a lower tooth on the same side. Um, so it's very sometimes very difficult to identify uh, with a very with a very high degree of security that the, the tooth the patient is complaining is really the, the responsible tooth. Another big problem in this case is obtaining efficient anesthesia. And so we have uh, very often to um, to to do a, a complementary anesthesia uh, to complement the the mandibular block or the vestibular infiltrative anesthesia that we we did before. The main the our main uh, weapon here is the intrapulpal anesthesia, in which we we are going to anesthetize inside the pulp. But we can also use the PDL anesthesia, so in which we anesthetize inside the periodontal ligament, the, the interligamentary anesthesia, or the interosseous anesthesia. The intrapulpal anesthesia is, the, is usually very, very efficient, but we have a problem is that we need to have some communication with the pulp chamber and then we put we place the needle inside this communication and we inject the anesthetic uh, solution inside the, the pulp and inside the canal sometimes we we need to to open a little more the the, the orifice the communication uh, the use of ultrasonic tips is very um, useful in this uh, in this situation because it's a bit less aggressive than uh, than uh, uh, the high speed or or another type of drill. The PDL anesthesia is. Uh, uh, another type of anesthesia that we can use if we are not able to get a communication with the pulp. And in this case we will place the, the needle along the, the periodontal ligament and we, can, we will then uh, deposit the anesthetic uh, solution in the, in the Periodontal ligament. We should we should administrate 0.2 mill, milliliters of anesthetic solution for each root. There are some some devices, some special syringes to do this, but um, uh, they will amplify the force of your hand, and they will. Uh, 
administrate uh, the anesthetic solution too too fast. So I think it's better to to do it just with a regular syringe and uh, do it very slowly uh, and steadily with the uh, and feeling the resistance of the periodontal ligament in your hand. Another type of anesthesia that is usually very, very efficient is the intraosseous anesthesia or osteocentral anesthesia, in which we will place the, the anesthetic solution very close to the root apex and it will uh, usually anesthetize the, the tooth very uh, efficiently. We have to, in this case, we have to anesthetize first the gingiva and the mucosa and then we will place the needle in the, between the, the, the tooth we want and the, and the tooth immediately uh, distal and and in this position we will place the anesthetic here and it will uh, it will anesthetize the the tooth we, we want there are some different ways to do this the most simple is to use uh, some uh, some devices that are have been designed for this in which the the needle uh, serves also as a, a drill to uh, perforate the, the bone and inject eventually the, the anesthetic solution in the, in the position we want. Another, another difficulty is sometimes to find the canal orifice because of the bleeding. When we have a very, uh, very acute inflammation of the pulp chamber, uh, as soon as we, as we enter the the, the pulp, uh, there's an intense bleeding, and it seems not to stop. Uh, and we have sometimes it's not very easy to find the canal orifice, so we must stop the bleeding first so that you can see the, the canals and, and then when we enter the canals and take off the, and remove the pulp tissue the bleeding will immediately stop. Which are the treatment options for irreversible pulpitis? Well, we have to remove the pulp so the best is to to do to perform a complete pulpectomy, and then we have to shape, clean, and fill all the canal system. But sometimes we, these patients come in a non-scheduled. Uh, they don't have a real an appointment, and we don't have the the time needed to to do all the all that should be done. To, to complete the treatment. So we have to do an emergency treatment that is the, to do just a coronal pulpectomy or maybe the coronal and main canal. Like this, we relieve the pain of the patient and uh, then we can reschedule him for a, for a proper appointment in which we will do all the all the root canal treatment. Another option is the extraction. Some teeth are not uh, liable to, for, to, um, to have a complete uh, root canal treatment and uh, some, t some of these teeth are not restorable and, uh, and so we should, we should uh, indicate the extraction. In many cases, we m must use some medication, and the medication we we use is 
analgesics like paracetamol, tramadol, clonixin. We can use traditional uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, the clofenac, naproxen, or we can use the uh, COX 2 selective uh, NSAIDs like etoricoxib, which has the advantage of uh, being less aggressive to, to the <coughs> gastrointestinal uh, tract and uh, also uh, to not interfere with the coagulation with the, and with the platelet uh, ag aggregation process. The other situation that can uh, lead to an endodontic emergency of pulpal origin is the cracked tooth. The crack or vertical tooth fracture usually comes, uh, the patient complains of sudden pain, also a painful reaction to cold stimuli. But the pain, although being sudden and uh, uh, cold reactive, is inconstant. Sometimes the patient uh, may, may stay one or two days without feeling pain and then he will feel suddenly with, without really understanding what causes the pain. When we examine these patients, uh, it's not very easy to, to come to a conclusion. Uh, we can use some transillumination to, to try to see if there's a, a difference in the light transmission in the crown and then to, to see the crack. We can use a tooth sleuth like so in here it's a, a plastic device. We ask the patient to to bite on and uh, on this uh, on this uh, device. Uh, we place it on one cusp, on the other cusp, and we can check cusp by cusp the how the tooth reacts. If there's a, a crack or a, a vertical incomplete fracture. The, when the, the patient bites in the affected uh, cusp, it will uh, trigger some pain. The other idea to, to try to, to see the, the crack is to use a dye. And here we can see there's a, a longitudinal fracture in this tooth that uh, eventually will lead to its uh, to its loss so we have to to evaluate how deep is the fracture if the fracture is uh, is not too deep if you can see the limits uh, the tooth will be uh, possible to save. If the, the fracture goes until the, the apex, of course it's not restorable. And we have to think of the possibility of doing a full crown. If uh, we have to evaluate if there is a ferrule, a ferrule that will allow us to, to do a full crown to keep the tooth together. Usually there's a need for endodontic treatment, although in very small cracks and uh, in very specific situations it might not be needed. But usually it is, we need to do endodontic treatment and then we'll have to, to use a temporary crown or an orthodontic band during the treatment. And which are the periodontal 
uh, emergencies of endodontic origin. So, we have symptomatic apical periodontitis, which is the bacterial invasion that follows pulp necrosis, development of a complex biofilm. This complex biofilm will interact with the periapical tissues at the foraminal areas, leading to a conflict between the bacterial proliferation and the host defense mechanisms. Well, here we can see in this drawing the, the proliferation of bacteria in the in the space, in the pulp space, where the the pulp has become necrotic, and the, so it the bacteria can can invade this space because they there is no no f fighters to to hold the, this uh, this army. The Inflamed pulp is go going towards the apex, is going apically, and uh, at a certain point we have all the pulp is necrotic, mm -hmm. and uh, the pulp space is completely full with the uh, bacteria and the uh, biofilm. In, in this occasion, we can see the development of a periapical lesion. Uh, that uh, is a result of the conflict between the bacteria and the bacterial products and the host defense mechanisms. This, in this lesion, due to this conflict, uh, we have the release of inflammation mediators and uh, we'll have uh, several immune and inflammatory reactions in the periodontal space with the production of exudates. This exudate infiltrates the periodontal ligament space and the pressure increases on the periodontal fibers which are already sensitized by the, the inflammatory mediators. So this is a very sensible zone that uh, furthermore is becoming uh, under pressure for the, because of the accumulation of exudate in this uh, space that should be empty, empty of liquid, full of fibers. So, which are the, the symptoms? The symptoms of the um, symptomatic apical periodontitis are related to the aggression to, to PDL. There's an intense pain caused by biting, by all masticatory movements. And there's a sensation of supraocclusion. Actually, the tooth can really be uh, a little bit higher than, the, than all the others. And uh, so it will be the first to come in contact with the, with the, the opponent. Examination of the of these uh, these patients. Well, we can uh, we can look for color alteration. Um, being a, a, a necrotic tooth, sometimes we can see the, the the tooth will be more yellowish or brownish. And uh, so we should check for color differences. Many times there is a caries or restoration without a clear communication with the oral cavity. These teeth are usually very tender to touch. And when we touch them, they will feel a very intense pain. And so the so is the percussion. If we are going to to do the percussion test, it will uh, trigger a quite intense pain. 
On the contrary, the sensitivity tests usually have a negative answer. So these teeth do not re uh, respond to cold or hot stimuli. The radiographs are often not very conclusive because this is a very uh, a very short uh, short life uh, situation. So uh, the apical periodontitis usually began very uh, some few days ago only, and uh, there is no time to 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 have a, a real radiographic uh, repercussion. But we can see many times a discrete enlargement of the periodontal ligament space, like here. Is we can see here uh, an enlargement of the space. Here it's more clear after after some days. This is still clear when the treatment is finished, and after. After six months, the, everything is back to normal. So, what's the treatment for the symptomatic apical periodontitis? It depends on the pulpal diagnosis. If the diagnosis is uh, pulpal necrosis, which is the, by far the most common, we'll have to do endodontic treatment. If the pulpal diagnosis is uh, vital pulp, then the apical periodontitis is not from pulpal origin and usually a simple occlusal relief will be enough. The other situation, uh, emergency situation of periodontal uh, origin, periodontal ovigodontic origin, is the acute apical abscess. This is another very characteristic uh, uh, emergency situation. In the acute apical abscess, bacteria pass the foramen in large numbers, invading the apical periodontium. This causes the release of chemotactic factors and this causes the the arrival to the to this uh, area of uh, large amounts of uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. The PMN are are very uh, active in releasing their lysosomic enzymes to to kill the bacteria, which is their main task. But uh, these lysosomic enzymes <coughs> are not very specific and they will kill everything that comes in front of them. Not only bacteria, but also uh, host cells. And this will cause a liquefaction necrosis with the production of pus. And so, what are the symptoms of the acute apical abscess? We'll start with the pulsating pain. It's a pain where where the patient uh, refers that he can feel the the heartbeat in the in the tooth. Patient uh, very often also refer a, a spontaneous pain, pain to to chewing, to biting, uh, mobility of the tooth pain to touch and to percussion and systemic signs and symptoms like fever, for instance. The radiographs, well, they usually show a discrete enlargement of the periodontal ligament space or 
in other occasions when the acute apical abscess evolves from a chronic lesion, we can see a clear radiolucency. So here we have the the discrete enlargement of the PDL space. This is a first time uh, apical abscess. And here we have the the clear radiolucency. This is an abscess that evolved from a chronic lesion. There are several types of acute apical abscess or to well, to express better the we can see the the apical abscess in different phases. We can see the initial abscess, the superiosal abscess and the final phase abscess. Well, the initial abscess is the situation where we have the necrotic pulp. Uh, the pulp space is completely full with uh, bacteria, biofilm, uh, and um, the polymorphonuclears are in this area uh, releasing the lysosomic enzymes which will cause a liquefaction and production of pus here. This uh, conflict continues and the, the polymorphonucleus continue here releasing more lysosomic enzymes and uh, causing the production of more pus. The pus accumulates here and uh, at a certain point the pressure of the pus here uh, pushes the tooth out um, and this is really very painful. This explains the mobility of the tooth and the uh, extreme sensitivity to to bite and to just the contact with the opponent tooth. So in this uh, initial abscess we have no swelling because all the, the, the the pus is very well contained inside the, the periapical lesion. There's a huge pressure on periapical tissues and the, uh, the tooth is very, very sensitive to, to mobilization, and is very sensitive to movement and to, to touch. So uh, we need to do the excess cavity and the, uh, the vibration caused by the handpiece, by the, the, the burrs we need to use, will, uh, will trigger a very intense pain. So we have to, to make the, the tooth stable, either by holding it with two fingers or by uh, splinting it to the adjacent teeth with the, with the composite. There are some isolation difficulties in these cases because uh, due to, to, to what I've just said, it's sometimes very painful to place the rubber dam in these teeth. So uh, we have to, many times we have to put the, place the rubber, the rubber dam clamp in a, a more posterior tooth. The, we should, in these cases, uh, uh, prescribe some anti-inflammatory or analgesics uh, because this is a really a very painful situation. And if we cannot uh, achieve some drainage, we maybe we should prescribe an antibiotic. But. In most cases, as soon as we uh, do, as we perform the excess cavity, uh, we see the uh, a very sp a spontaneous <coughs> drainage of the, the exudate, the pus, the, some blood uh, from the from the root canal. In other occasions, we have to 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 explore the canal with a with a file, and after that the the 
drainage is is triggered and we 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 see the, the pus and the accident coming out of the root canal system. In this case we had to this 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 two uh, lower incisors were very very uh, sensitive uh, very tender to to touch so we had to to place the rubber dam clamp in the premolar to to keep it far from the the affected teeth. So the other situation is the superiosal abscess. The superiosal abscess uh, in, the, in this one we have a consistent edema. Uh, there's an enormous pressure on both the periapical tissues and the periosteum. There's no fluctuation. It's uh, it's very very consistent. It's very hard. We it's like rubber when we we touch it. We need to drain the purulent exudate from this uh, this area to relieve the the, the patient. And we should consider medication with the non uh, anti inflammatory drugs and uh, analgesic. If we cannot achieve drainage, we should consider prescribing antibiotics. The superiosal abscess is the, the case in which the, the pus from the Periapical lesion is starts to find its way to the usually to the buccal plate, and here it will start to to accumulate beneath the periosteum, and will force the periosteum away from the bone. And the, this, this movement, this uh, pressure on the periosteum is extremely painful. Here we see a case, we see the, clearly the swelling in the face. Inside we see the, the, the swelling also. This uh, yellow color beneath the the mucosa is the accumulation of pus here, and so we have to to do an incision. And this incision should also cut the periosteum to release the pus from beneath. And this, in this case, we will we we'll have a, a drainage. Other type of the final phase abscess is the third type of, uh, of abscess we can find. Here, there's finally there's a, a, the pus will will break the periosteum and will accumulate in the submucosa, and then we'll have some fluctuation. So the final phase abscess uh, is uh, characterized by a swelling on the buccal of li or lingual aspect of the alveolar bone. We'll have fluctuation. We need to obtain drainage, and we can obtain it through the excess cavity, which is the, usually what we do. But we can also do an incision in the fluctuation zone. Usually, as soon as we do the 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 excess cavity, the pus and the pus with uh, with blood will start to to drain, and sometimes it drains for a long period of time. And after that, we we should we should uh, stimulate this drainage to to get rid of all this uh, exudate and all this pus, 
and uh, eventually it will stop and we will be able to to perform a root canal treatment and to to clean and shape the canals. The the emergencies that happen during the treatment are usually complications, uh, mishaps or flare-ups. The mishaps or flare-ups the the most frequent are the uh, hypochlorite accident, the perforation, the over instrumentation and the extrusion of debris of material. Well, so let's talk a bit about the hypochlorite accident. This is a serious, a very severe situation in which while we are irrigating the canal, suddenly the the patient complains of a very violent, uh, very immediate pain uh, and uh, sometimes you can see the swelling uh, that starts immediately in that uh, moment. There is also usually a prolonged bleeding in the canal. This is due to a lack of control in the irrigation and prevention is actually the key to avoid this this situation but uh, sometimes you cannot avoid it, avoid it and then it should wash truly with saline or distilled water and then uh, prescribe a corticosteroid and an analgesic and antibiotic in very serious cases we should consider the need to refer to a hospital. Perforations are other type of, uh, of uh, complications or mishaps and they usually they can be any different way uh, in any direction but possible. The, so they can be proximal, they can be buccal, they can be on the floor. Um, the, the main uh, causes are retraction of the pulp chamber or an inclination of tooth, uh, radicular curves. Uh, sometimes these are, have crowns, are restored with crowns that do not, uh, that are not on the the, the same axis of the tooth, so this can uh, can mislead uh, when we are doing the excess cavity. Another cause is the excessive drilling on in thin roots uh, to to place a, a post or to uh, just to to enlarge the canal sometimes uh, there's too much drilling. The, the signs that uh, uh, perforation was done is the bleeding in the root canal and the, uh, the perforation should be closed as soon as possible. The soonest the best. You can see here a perforation in this uh, canal so in this case, we were able to to bypass to find the right canal and to uh, to fill to fill either the the canal and the perforation. This one has a, a very a very severe curvature in this root. And uh, when the post was placed here, there was an excessive drilling in this area, leading to, to a perforation and to this uh, uh, <coughs> lateral lesion. So this had to be uh, treated surgically, and the MTA was placed here and the, the lesion resolved. 
Over instrumentation is another possibility. This is the uncontrolled enlargement of the foramen and uh, results in a mechanical aggression to the periapical tissues. Debris are pushed out and uh, this leads to a very easy overextension of filling. In this case, due to the aggression to the periapical tissues, we may need to prescribe some NSAIDs or analgesics. And in the uh, most severe cases, endodontic surgery may be necessary. Like in this case, in which uh, over instrumentation and over extension and uh, extrusion of material was uh, happened in this tooth. So we had to, to perform some endodontic surgery and we see here six months after and two, two years later. Flare-up is another type of uh, endodontic emergency that usually gives us a bad feeling because uh, no one likes to to do some treatment and uh, to see the patient return two days or three days later uh, feeling uh, very intense pain uh, and uh, complaining. So this is due to the pushing the debris out through the foramen to the periapical tissues. And uh, these debris are usually necrotic remnants, uh, microorganisms, endotoxins, other irritants, every other irritant you can think of will be pushed out of the foramen. So this will cause an acute inflammatory reaction in the periapical tissues and um, this is not very pleasant for the patient. There is, we can also have a reactivation of a previous lesion due to the bacterial invasion. And also there can be some metabolic changes in the bacteria of the biofilm. Uh, this uh, bacteria, this biofilm is usually multi-species uh, multi and um, many bacteria in the biofilm are facultative anaerobics uh, but uh, when they get some uh, some change in the environment they can they can move to aerobic uh, metabolic uh, uh, ways and uh, this this will lead to a, to an increase in their activity and to reactivation of the of, uh, of the lesion So, in the flare-up, we have to think if there is really a need for drainage or just we just need to do some uh, occlusal adjustments and uh, prescribe some anti-inflammatory and analgesic drugs. So, endodontic emergency is always a very stressful situation but we need to keep uh, calm, we need to show calm, we need to uh, transport this calm to our patient. And the uh, management of the emergency gives back the well-being to the patient and leaves in the professional a uh, pleasant and a very strong feeling of professional fulfillment. Thank you very much for being here and bye-bye.